So I'm Anna. I'm an AI graduate student here. I work sort of on the intersection between AI, artificial intelligence, and cognitive science. Um, and I'm co-advised by Tom Griffiths in psychology and Dan Klein here. So AI, um, big field. I'm just going to do my best to give you an overview of some of the main ideas and topics. Um, obviously, I can't cover all of it. Um, but hopefully, this will give you a sense of it. Um, this up there, we have a robot bicyclist, which is kind of cool. Um, and to get you thinking um, about some of the things we're going to talk about, with a robot, you have lots of things you need to do. You need to be able to figure out the motion, actually, for instance, grasping the handlebars, those feet. Um, you also need to figure out images. When I see an image, it's just pixels on the screen. How do I figure out, for instance, whether it's a wall in front of me or just more pavement? Um, with more advanced robots, you need things like speech recognition, ability to synthesize voices, et cetera. So we're going to talk about some of those challenges and also see a couple of videos. So it'll be a good time. So oh, um, let you know, we're going to start off with just the definition of AI. Um, I think there's lots of confusion about what AI is or isn't is, or isn't. Um, and um, so we'll give a characteristic of that. Um, some AI history. So AI started off, um, everybody was really excited, and then there was a long period of AI is never going to work, this is just not going to happen. Um, and then it has revived, it's had lots of successes in recent years, um, so why did that occur? And there was sort of a fundamental change in how people thought about AI. Then we'll get a tour of some of the cool areas of AI, and then step back to thinking about what does it mean for a computer to think, how should we characterize that? So. This is John McCarthy, who sadly passed away last October. Um, but he was one of the founders of AI at Stanford. Um, and he said that AI is getting a computer to do things which, when done by people, are said to involve intelligence. So this ignores a lot of things like, well, if a computer does something intelligent, what does that mean? Do we have to change laws about what is a person, et cetera? It finesses all of that. It ignores things about consciousness, et cetera. But it gets to the core issue of, basically, we want computers to do things that seem sort of smart. And what do we characterize as smart? Well, when people do things. Um, and so he's making that um, analogy between these things. And so when people started off thinking about, how should we do AI? How should we make computers do things that are supposed to be intelligent? They started off small. They said, well, I don't know. You know I'm in the 1950s. I my computer doesn't run that fast. I don't have that much processing power. Let's start on sort of a small, miniature world and see how well we can do there. Um, and so this began, um, there's this big conference in 1956. Um, some really cool projects were presented, including um, with Alan Newell, a sort of pioneer in computer science, um, presented a logic prover. Um, so probably high school geometry, you had some sort of sentence uh, like, prove something about the angles when two lines intersect. Um, and you had some axioms. And you had to go from those axioms to proving that statement. And so in 1956, they had something that could take things like that in actually logical sentences, but same idea, and automatically prove various theorems, um, and including you know, some theorems that hadn't ever been proven before, so that people had failed to find a proof for, their theorem prover was able to find a proof for which is really quite cool. Because <laughs> you don't think of you know, 1956 computers as being able to do that. Um, and so people were really optimistic about this symbolic reasoning and rules and symbols approach. So an approach where we have a limited set of things, and we have discrete ways of going from one to another. So there isn't a lot of uncertainty about what is this logical symbol, what logical sentence is entailed next. You have set rules for how you get from one thing to another. And this seemed promising. Um, so another example um, was Shirtaloo by Terry Winograd. So this was, he had a computer, um, he had some blocks in this little mini world. Um, it was just all on the screen, but the computer could manipulate the blocks on the screen. Um, and it could actually work with natural language text. So with asterisk, sort of limited natural language text. But um, the person might type in, pick up a big red block, and the computer does it. Person says, grasp the pyramid. And you'll notice in this image there are a couple of pyramids. So there's this green pyramid here and this pink pyramid here. The computer says, I don't understand which pyramid you mean. So it figures out, like sort of a smart human might be, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. You need to give me more information. Um, and it also could do things 
like figure out somewhat more complex natural language. So a person says, find a block which is taller than the one you're holding and put it into the box. So it, you have to do a reference back to earlier in the sentence to figure that out. And that's actually, in bigger text, uh, figuring out what it refers to is actually a really hard problem much of the time. So they were like, hey, this, this computer can do it. It's working well in these small, limited rules and symbols worlds. This is going to work out for us. Um, and so people were really, really optimistic. Um, there was also some research about neural networks. So people said, hey, your brain is made up of lots of little individual neurons. They communicate to each other in relatively simple ways. Maybe that can be something we use for artificial intelligence. And so they had very simple neural networks, just a set of neurons that you give some input to. They do something, and uh, then some neurons give some output, um, where neurons is a small little function on the computer. Um, and again, they thought, hey, this is working pretty well. But both of these approaches ran into major difficulties, such that in the mid-'70s, most funding for AI research got cut off. People said AI is never going to work out. Some people called the 1980s sort of the AI winter. Um, thought, what, and why did this happen? You might say, this seems to be working well. We just need to scale it up. Um, so one thing to get you thinking about why that might not have worked out is let's think about, all right, you have something, you want to program something that figures out whether something is a dog. So the first thing you might do is say, I need a rule that tells me whether, you know, is, do all dogs meet this rule? One of the big problems that came up with the rules and symbols approach was when you're working with the real world, things get a lot messier. Um, so you might say, well, all dogs have four legs. But let's say my dog has an accident, sadly loses a leg. It's still a dog, right? Or what if you, know, you only see part of the dog? You only see the dog's head and the rest of it's occluded. You still want to say it's a dog. Um, and this problem arises all the time with the rules and symbols approach. When you're actually trying to deal with everything in the real world, it gets a lot more complicated. Um, so one of the key ideas they had um, when AI came back, um, so AI started having success again, was to think about probabilities and uncertainty. So people brought in some statistics and some pr probability and said, this isn't going to be possible to define exactly this is this, this is that. We have one hard rule that separates everything. Um, they said, well, rather than trying to specify a dog exactly, what's the probability that the image I'm looking at is a dog? So turning things into, let me figure out the most likely thing, rather than I have to have explicit rules, this or that. And so you might think about it in like speech recognition. The sound waves coming from my mouth, they don't sound exactly like some, you know, really like anyone else when they say the exact same words. But a speech recognition system can figure out that the most likely sequence, uh, sequence of words that I'm saying is some particular <coughs> sequence. Um, and that's been really key for making most AI, AI systems work um, today. So one thing you might have seen, if any of you guys saw Watson play Jeopardy, I think that was last year. Um, this is a computer program that played Jeopardy. Um, and it was really neat that one of the things it did is it gave its confidence. So it had a confidence rating. If it was some cutoff threshold uh, percent sure, then it would beep in, it would give an answer. Um, so it had some idea how likely it was it was right, rather than just, I'm right, I'm not right, I can't produce an answer. 